All right, this is our first uh, lesson to, um, for the uh, book of Colossians. This class is the book of uh, Colossians and this is the introductory lesson for this new series that we're beginning uh, this morning. Um, um, I'd like to first begin by talking about themes. Uh, you may not uh, realize it if you're just reading through you know, the New Testament, well, the entire Bible as a matter of fact, uh, but every book in the Bible has a particular theme. It was written with a particular purpose um, in order to reach uh, a goal of either knowledge or theology or history, but every book has a, 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 an end goal, an idea. For example, Genesis tells the story of the creation and the beginnings of the human race. Uh, the book of Jeremiah, for example, records the warnings of the destruction that would come on Jerusalem. That's what that book is about. Uh, if we go to the New Testament, Matthew uh, shows to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah according to the Old Testament. Um, the book of John does basically the same thing, but he's addressing a, a Gentile audience. The book of Acts uh, recounts the story of the establishment of the early church. Uh, the epistle to the Romans is the major thesis on the basic doctrines of Christianity. That's what that book is about. Galatians was written as a defense of the Gentiles' right to be free in Christ and part of the church. Uh, the book of Ephesians was written as an appeal to the Gentile Christians to accept their Jewish brethren and to strive for unity in the church. I, those are just a couple. Thing is, when you know the themes of the books, it's so helpful in your study and if you're going to teach someone else. Someone has a question about a particular character or when did this happen or why and so on and so forth. If you know the themes of the books, it helps you to kind of zero in to go where in the Bible where that material talks about the thing that you're, you know, that you're trying to teach. So uh, I, we could go on, that's a study in itself. You know, uh, critical, you know, cr they're called critical introductions. You know? uh, some, there are some uh, studies where all they do are critical introductions of each book. They don't actually do the you know, line by line study, they just tell you what the book is about, who wrote it, when it was written, and what the purpose of the book was. Uh, that's not what we're going to do here, I was just trying to give you a little, a little taste uh, of that. Well, all this to say that the book of Colossians is no exception. It has a purpose. The book of Colossians was written as a doctrinal statement on the deity and the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ. If you're talking to somebody and they say, where does it say that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, where does it say He's divine? I don't see that anywhere. In, in your mind, you know, you're thinking, wait a minute, the book of Colossians. You want me to show you where the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is divine? Okay, let's go to the book of Colossians and let's read that and you'll see for yourself. Okay, that's the point I'm making here with this, these few introductory remarks. Uh, this is why I say that those who want to you know, strengthen their faith in Jesus as the divine Son of God, strengthen our, our faith and our hope in His power to save us, this is the book to read. It's my favorite epistle. Favorite epistle because it is Christ, it totally Christ-centered. Okay? So um, before we begin you know, a reading and study of this book, because this is going to be a textual study, you know, line by line, all the way through from chapter one to the end. Before we start that, I want to take a look at some background material for this book so that you can put this book and what is written in it into proper historical context. Okay? A good way of doing this is by reviewing the, a timeline of the life and the ministry of Paul, who is the author of this epistle. By reviewing his life, we can see when he wrote this, why it was written, so on and so forth. So let's do that. <clears throat> That'll be the bulk of our class, uh, um, bulk of our introductory class this morning. So let's start with uh, Paul's ministry, shall we? So from 32 to 34 AD, Paul was born in the city of Tarsus, which um, uh, is in modern day Turkey. He was educated in Jerusalem uh, and served as a Pharisee and a special envoy 
for the rulers in uh, the, the political and the religious uh, rulers in Jerusalem uh, to, um, uh, to hunt down and try to break up this new faith, this Christian faith that had, that had developed. Uh, um, he was converted uh, while persecuting Christians near Damascus. Uh, and he preached in this area and spent time in the Arabian desert before entering uh, full-time, if you wish, Christian ministry, 32 to 34 AD. 35 AD, he first tried to associate with the apostles, but he was rejected out of fear for his past violence against the church. They didn't want to have anything to do with him at first. And ultimately, he was introduced and vouched for by uh, Barnabas. From 36 to 42 AD, he returned to his hometown to preach and teach. You know, when you read the book of Acts, a lot of times you think that all that stuff happened like in two years or something. But it, 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 the book of Acts is extremely compressed, tells a story that, go, that goes on over many, many years in you know, just a few chapters. So you know, 36 to 42, that's, that's, a, that's a good piece of time. You don't really hear much about him. He's in his hometown, he's preaching. He's teaching. In 42, from 42 to 44 AD, he is recruited by Barnabas to work in Antioch, which is in modern day Syria, uh, as a teacher. This church was the first mixed congregation. By being mixed, I mean Jews and Gentiles together in the same uh, congregation. And, and Paul as, uh, um, was well equipped as a Roman citizen and a Jewish teacher, formerly a Pharisee, to work with a a mixed group. He was a Roman citizen because the city of Tarsus and that area was, was conquered by the Romans. And instead of conquering them militarily, they made a deal that you know, they would uh, submit to Rome and, and in exchange for that, Rome granted the citizens of that area Roman citizenship. And this is, how, this is why Paul was born a Roman citizen because the area where he lived, the city where he lived, had been granted that privilege by the empire at the time you know, in order to forego military action. It was a deal. Okay? You pay taxes, we give you Roman citizenship. So as a Roman citizen and a Pharisee, well taught in the scriptures, he was well equipped to teach a mixed group in the church, which was the situation in Antioch. Uh, in 44 AD, in 44 AD uh, he served with a group who were collecting funds to help the poor people in Jerusalem. Then in 45 all the way to 57 AD, 45 to 57 AD, he was chosen by God and he was sent by the church in Antioch to preach to the Jews and Gentiles outside of Israel and he made three major missionary journeys throughout the Roman uh, Mediterranean Empire in a span of about 12 years. If you remember correctly, and here I'm kind of preaching to the choir, pretty good Bible students here, you remember when he was first converted, the Lord revealed to him that he would be the apostle you know, to the Gentiles. Well, there's a long period of time that took place between the time you know, he fell down and he saw the Lord and you know, he was blinded and then he was healed. And there was a long period of time before he was actually called to do that ministry. And what do you think he was doing during that time? Well, he was in training. He was learning, he was teaching, he was working. And when a certain period of time passed, when the Spirit of God felt that the time was ready, knew that the time was ready, he was called. So in Acts 13 we read about, we read about his uh, calling. From 58 to 60 AD he was detained in Caesarea for two years awaiting the outcome of hearings based on accusations of sedition by the leaders in Jerusalem. We know what happened, there's a riot and they arrest him and so on and so forth and they put him in jail and he goes before different rulers. He has three hearings before a series of local rulers and ultimately he appeals for a hearing before Caesar in Rome and he does this to avoid further detainment or plots by the Jews to kill him. He knows he's in jail, he's not far from Jerusalem. They're trying to figure out ways to have him killed. The longer he stays in jail, you know, the more difficult it becomes for him to be free and the more dangerous it becomes. So he appeals to Caesar to be able to be sent to Rome 
between 58 and 60 AD. 60 and 61 AD has a disastrous trip uh, by sea, which ends up in a shipwreck, but Paul and the crew are saved, eventually ending up in Rome uh, under house arrest. From 61 to 63 AD, ultimately Luke, he's the one that recounts the story in the book of Acts, tells us that Paul was moved to prison in Rome while awaiting his hearing or his trial, if you wish, before Caesar. Um, and during this time, he's defending himself of charges of insurrection and conspiracy. And it's interesting that it was exactly the same charges that they made against Jesus. Insurrection, conspiracy, you know, and so on and so forth. While in prison, and it, while he was in Rome this first time, uh, he was in prison, but it was more like house arrest. Wasn't that, he wasn't in a dungeon here, he it was like house arrest because he could receive visitors and fellow workers and he was able to teach and, and interact with, uh, with many of the Jews and <clears throat> individuals in the city. He was even successful in evangelizing many among the servants and the guards in Caesar's household. We read about that in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. In 63 AD, it seems that after these two years, he did plead his case before Caesar and he won his release. Between 64 and 66 AD, now it gets a little tricky here, in some of his letters, Paul had mentioned previously that his plan was to return to Jerusalem with the special collection of funds that he had, go back to Rome to strengthen the church there, and then push on to Spain in order to open up new frontiers for the gospel, because that's what he was about. He wanted to preach the gospel to new places. He didn't want to go where other people went. He wanted to go where nobody had gone. So he wanted to push on to what we know today uh, as Spain. Now, uh, there's some evidence in the non-biblical writings of the time, in other words, historians of the time, that he may have done this when he was freed from prison the first time. Uh, others, however, say the following. After his arrest in Jerusalem and imprisonment and in Rome for two years, his plans changed. In other words, before he went to jail, his goal was to push on to, you know, to be in Jerusalem, push on to Rome, then go to Spain. But then he was arrested. His plans were kind of blown up. Spends time in jail, goes to Rome. So after he's released, he doesn't go to Spain during his brief freedom from prison. But from some references from various epistles, we can see a different plan for this freedom. For example, there's evidence that he spent time in Crete. Titus chapter one, verse five. Crete, large island in the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, he went to Ephesus, 1 Timothy 1, 3. We know that he traveled to Corinth, 2 Timothy 4.20. He stopped at Troas, 2 Timothy 4.13. He went to Miletus, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20. So we could make a case for the fact that he used his brief time of freedom to encourage established churches. So 1 Timothy and Titus are letters that suggest that Paul was free and active working with these young preachers and others in his work of strengthening established churches. And so some scholars believe that after his first imprisonment in Rome, 64 to 66 AD, Paul became active in strengthening these churches and it's believed that it was during this time that he wrote the first letter to Timothy and the letter to Titus. Okay, so a great turning point in Paul's life and ministry as well as the progress of the church occurred in 64 AD. Uh, 64 AD, this is the year that uh, Nero, the emperor, burned down the city of Rome. He was responsible for the great fire. Now Nero, a little background, was a great builder. He liked to build things, liked public projects, and he secretly began the fire in order to make way for a kind of newer and more glorious Roman city that he would rebuild according to his plan. I mean, if you've got a lot of buildings and you want to build, and nobody wants to kind of knock them down, you know, starting a fire is a pretty good idea if you're the, if you're the emperor, that way they, you know, they knock everything down and you get to do it your way. Um, historians tell us that he also was a fiddle player and he played the fiddle 
uh, while the fire raged on out of sheer joy that the destruction gave him. Wow, I'm going to get my way, hallelujah. I don't know what he was playing, but anyway, that's why you know, Nero fiddles while Rome burns. That's where that comes from. Of course, to divert attention and blame from himself, who do you think he accused? Well, he accused Christians of setting the fire because everybody knew that Christians considered Rome a wicked place, so they had a motive. Christians had a motive, and so he passed the blame on to them. Now, the Bible doesn't mention Nero as the persecutor of the church, even though this trouble is the background of at least two epistles. Second Timothy and First Peter kind of make reference to this. We get information about this persecution from, Roman, from the Roman historian Tacitus, who knew about Nero's involvement and his false accusations of Christians. Now he knew that Christians of that time were an easy target because they were without any influence and mostly they were despised by the, you know, by the people, by the citizens, the pagan citizens of Rome. Nero accused them for the fire and he ordered their persecution. Multitudes of Roman Christians were arrested and put to death in very cruel ways. When we talk about the Roman persecutions, what we're talking about here. Roman persecution, you know, it, there were different periods of it. It wasn't just one long thing. It would, there would be a persecution, then there'd be a lull, and, so, and then it would rise up again. So this is the persecution during the time of uh, Nero. Uh, quite cruel, some of them were crucified. You know, we always talk about Jesus' crucifixion, but crucifixion was something that the Romans used for all types of criminals, except Roman citizens. If you're a Roman citizen, it was against the law to be cruci crucified. It was considered a much too debasing way uh, to die. Uh, some of them had animal skins tied to them and then they were thrown into a pit with wild dogs to be uh, murdered. Some were simply placed in the arena with wild animals to be killed. You know, we, we've seen that in movies and so on and so forth. Uh, Nero would even take some and impale them on stakes, pour tar over them, and then use them as human torches to light the imperial gardens. This was the, you know, the length of his depravity and his cruelty. In 67 AD, it was during this period of persecution that Paul was rearrested not at the insistence of angry Jews this time, but as a recognized leader of a religious group who had allegedly burned down the city of Rome. And under this uh, charge, he was rearrested. So it was during the second and final imprisonment that Paul uh, endured that he wrote his last epistle, his last epistle to Timothy, or the last epistle, which is Second Timothy. Paul knew that with this second imprisonment he had very little hope of release, so he encourages Timothy to come and visit him in Rome before winter. You know that when he says, come before winter, bring the cloak, you know, well, he knows he's not getting out of jail. He knows it's the end. We believe that Paul was finally executed in Rome. He was beheaded uh, in the period between 66 and 67 AD. So in this brief review, we have a, a bit of an outline of Paul's activity, especially in the last years of his ministry leading up to his death. So you see uh, <coughs> a long period of ministry there, 30 plus years that he spent in various ways and uh, various activities. Okay, so now that we have a little information about Paul's activities from around 32 to his death in 67 AD, we can situate the particular letter uh, to the Colossian brethren. <coughs> Excuse me. So this letter here was written by Paul between 61 and 63 AD during his first imprisonment in Rome while he was awaiting his hearing before Caesar. We know Paul is the author because he names himself as the author in the very first verse, so it's very easy. He's, the first word, Paul. We know who wrote it. He says, Paul, an apostle. <coughs> so we have that right away. Um, uh, so he names himself right away as the author in the first verse. And this letter was universally accepted by the early church as an authentic letter from Paul. It, in other words, it circulated quite well in the early church. 
Uh, it seems that one of Paul's associates, Epaphroditus, uh, had come to Rome with a gift for Paul from the Philippian church. And while he was there, he informed the apostle of a dangerous heresy that was brewing in his home state or in his home congregation. Not Paul, but Epaphroditus' home congregation, which was in Colossae. Okay? Uh, in the epistle, you know that one chapter epistle, Philemon? In Philemon 23, uh, Philemon, or the, Paul tells us that Epaphroditus was also detained for a while with Paul but he was later released and given a letter to take back to the Philippians, thanking them for their gift. We kind of see here how things operated in the first century. You know, there was no, these, these people, they didn't have a mail, I mean the Romans had a mailing system, but not if you were in prison. So we see how information was distributed through the church. People would physically come. Paphroditus comes to bring him some money so, you know, so he can eat and buy things and so on and so forth. And while he's there, he gives them a report of what's going on in the church. There's trouble in one of the churches. So Paul writes a letter of thanks to go back to the Philippian church. Thank you for the gift, appreciate it. And we have the, the letter to the Philippians. That's the letter, okay? Now in the meantime, after Epaphroditus' departure, Paul writes three other letters to churches and people about different matters. One of them to the Colossians, regarding the false teaching and the heresy that they're dealing with. One to Philemon concerning a runaway slave, Onesimus, um, whom Paul had converted in prison and was sending back home to his master. And one to the church in Ephesus who was experiencing problems of unity and fellowship. He's in jail and he's just getting information about the churches and his only, the only thing he can do is write letters and have people deliver letters to different churches, hopefully dealing with their issues. Isn't it amazing? We have those letters. Word per word, we have exactly the letters that he was sending out. For someone looking from the outside in, must have thought, wow, these poor Christians, man, this, this movement is as good as dead. I mean, you know, the main leader's in jail. You know, he's, the only thing he can do is write you know, little letters to different churches. Isn't it amazing the, the power of God's word to last for, for so long? And so <clears throat> the letters are sent by hand of two other helpers, these three letters. One of them is Tychicus and of course Onesimus, the slave who's being released. Uh, we read about that in Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4. So it seems that Philemon was a member of the church at Colossae and Tychicus was there also, and this is where the converted slave Onesimus returned to as well, for they were mentioned in Colossians 4. So all these people, right, Tychicus, Onesimus, these people, Philemon, all these people, they're Colossians. They're in this church there, they're, they're, they're Colossians. So Tychicus is mentioned as the messenger that brings Paul's letter to the Ephesians as well. And so while in prison, let me just summarize here, while in prison in Rome between 61 and 63, Paul wrote several epistles, one of which was addressed to the brethren in Colossae and it was delivered to them by Tychicus. All right, so let's have a little background now uh, about Colossae. Again, modern day central uh, Turkey. In 500 BC, uh, Colossae had been a city of importance, especially as a trade center. But by New Testament times, it had lost its strategic importance to Ephesus, which was 100 miles to the west and closer to the sea and shipping traffic. See Ephesus there just above, uh, the, the, the name just above, just along the coast. By Paul's time, it had lost its prestige and was extremely decadent, the city of Colossae. The language of Paul's letter suggests that he had not been there personally. Interesting, he's writing to a church that he himself had not established. The church had been established by Epaphroditus, who was from that region. Now there was a period when Paul spent a long time in Ephesus. If we read the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, we find out that he spends a good long time in Ephesus. And he, from Ephesus, he sends Timothy and Epaphroditus to evangelize the surrounding area. And we believe it's during this evangelization 
you know, effort for this area, that Colossae may have been established during that, during that outreach period. Now an interesting footnote about Colossae was that it was, it was in the region of Phrygia. Okay? In the region of Phrygia. And Luke records that on the day of Pentecost, there were Phrygians who were present listening to Peter's sermon, who were converted in Acts chapter two, actually Acts chapter two, verse 10. So some of these Phrygians who heard the, the gospel message, you know, Pentecost, may have been converted at that time and brought the faith back with them to their home region of Colossae. And then when an evangelistic effort was mounted by Paul as he sends out Timothy and Epaphroditus, that particular church, some people already were, you know, had heard the gospel, were ready, and the church was planted um, uh, in that place. You know, what's interesting is we do, we do it the same way, don't we? We do the same thing. You know, we send out Bibles, you know, like the Eastern European missions. We send Bibles out to places we can't get to very easily. And people read the Bible and the, the seed, you know, the seed goes into their heart. Uh, Bible talk, what do you think we do? All those thousands of people that go there to watch videos and download stuff, they're from all over the world. They're from places where there is no church of Christ. And then somewhere along the way, some church says, you know what, we're going to mount an evangelism campaign, we're going to send some, pe some actual people to this area. And all of a sudden they discover, whoa, there are people here who, who've read the Bible, who know the gospel, who know the Lord, you know, they need more teaching, they need to be baptized. It's exactly the way we do it today. A friend of mine, uh, his name was uh, Kolesnikov, uh, Ivan Kolesnikov. He was a preacher, a Russian preacher from Russia in Montreal back in the 70s and 80s during the time of the Cold War, could not get into Russia, and he preached for like 25 years on the radio, actually shortwave radio. He would tape his messages and mail his tapes to a station somewhere in the north and they would put it on, they would broadcast it via shortwave I don't know if young people know what shortwave is. You know. Anyways, uh, shortwave to, uh, to, to Russia. For 20 to 25 years he did this. Finally, after the, you know, the curtain fell and there was more peace between the West and Russia and Russia opened up, you could actually travel there. Brother Kolesnikov, now almost in his 80s, traveled to Russia and lo and behold, he finds these house churches everywhere that had been planted by him on the radio that he wasn't, he wasn't aware of. They knew who he was. They had listened to him for years. I remember him coming back to Montreal and how joyful he was. So all this to say, we do it kind of the same way nowadays. We just have different tools. You know, we have different methods to, to do it, but it's always the same way. Okay, so <clears throat> a little bit of background now. Uh, about Colossae and why this letter was written. The heresy that occasioned the writing of this letter was a mixture of ideas from Greek philosophy, ancient oriental religions, and Jewish traditions. You took these three elements and you kind of, they mashed them up. It was being presented as a higher thought, a higher thought cult, and it was promoted as a kind of a new philosophy for Christianity. Some of its features included a call to worship angels as intermediaries between God and man. Does that sound familiar to you? Do we have religions today that ask us to pray to angels, saints, other you know, famous uh, you know, apostles, Mary, Jesus' mother? You know? This was the idea. There were other intermediaries to whom we could address our prayers. This was one of the features of this, this new philosophy that was coming up. Uh, also, it insisted on the observation of Jewish customs and laws to the point of asceticism. So every religion needs a kind of a box, right? So they took these ideas and they put them in the Jew box, the Jewish box, the Jewish religion box, because it had traditions and it had you know, sacrificial system, circumcision, don't eat pork, you know, whatever, food laws. So they took this new idea and they put it in the Jewish tradition box. 
and it also assumed that its teaching was a superior form of doctrine than what was presently or had been previously taught by the apostles and their disciples. The idea was, pff, Paul, Paul's teaching Peter, come on, that's old stuff, that's 20 years old, you, you get with it, we got something new, we have something better. So in response to these false teachings, Paul writes the letter to the Colossians, not as a way to debate them, but simply presenting the person of Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, Colossians, when you look at Colossians, I mean, what's it got? Four chapters, four chapters. And in four chapters, Paul makes a response to this you know, vast you know, new teaching that's coming out. Not by arguing point per point per point per point. He doesn't even, he doesn't even deal with their, you know, their ideas. He simply presents Jesus. Here's the real Jesus. So his objective is to show that Jesus, and by inclusion, his teachings, are preeminent, meaning they are first, they are superior in every area of life and spiritual knowledge, including this so-called higher knowledge that they were being presented. Now we have many who claim you know, the higher knowledge uh, today, don't we? A lot of people are saying, oh, the gospel, Christianity, so, you know, so last century, so old fashioned. What is that? You know, it, it's, for, it's for foolish people. People don't have a lot of education. I like, I like the way th they put us down. You know, oh, well, it's like, oh, you believe in Jesus. Oh, it's too bad. You know, it's such a sad thing you know, that you're not more enlightened. Maybe you should go to college. You know. A lot of uneducated people believe in Jesus. Yeah, I've heard that too. You know. A lot of uneducated people. You know, cling to their religion, so on and so forth. So we, we, we may not have the exact doctrines today that was in this higher thought idea 2,000 years ago, but we certainly have the attitude. We certainly have the attitude. And to this attitude, we present Jesus, that's all. To this attitude we present Jesus. This is why Colossians is my favorite epistle. It is the most Christocentric, meaning Christ-centered. It's all about Him and who He is. And the claims that Paul makes about Jesus are just so, so amazing. All right, so let's, um, let's take a look at just the outline, the way we're going to study this, very simple. Beautiful, if, if you're a minimalist, I'm a minimalist, I don't like to decorate stuff. You know. Lee says, what should we put on the birthday cake? Happy birthday. <laughs> but don't, shouldn't we have some flowers and little squirrels and stars? Happy birthday. I'm a minimalist. I, I, I don't like too much decorating. Okay, well, Maybe that's one of the reasons I like Colossians. Paul takes the subject which is bigger than all of us and somehow in four chapters presents Jesus, the Son of God, in a minimalist way. So here's the outline. The salutation, chapter one, verses one and two, uh, and, and here's the body. Christ, preeminent in personal relationships. Chapters one, uh, three to 29, Christ, Preeminent in doctrine, chapter 2, 1 to 3, 4. Christ, preeminent in ethics, chapter 3, 5 to 4, 1. And then he closes out with the conclusion and greeting to the brethren, chapter 4. So you know, uh, this is our first uh, lesson in this uh, particular series. But just to tell you, it's going to be a textual study. We're going to just take it line by line, you know, Starting at the first chapter one, verse one, all the way down to chapter four, the end, line by line. This is the, the type of study that, um, that it's going to be. All right, so there's our starting uh, lesson and uh, we'll see you next time for lesson two. Thank you.